Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21. Listen for God's word. After Jacob died, Joseph's brothers said to each other, What if Joseph still hates us and wants to get even with us for all the cruel things we did to him? So they sent this message to Joseph. Before our father died, he told us, You did some cruel and terrible things to Joseph, but you must ask him to forgive you. Now we ask you to please forgive the terrible things we did. After all, we serve the same God that your father worshipped. When Joseph heard this, he started crying. Right then, Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to the ground in front of him and said, We are your slaves. But Joseph told them, Don't be afraid. I have no right to change what God has decided. You tried to harm me, but God made it turn out for the best, so that he could save all these people, as he is now doing. Don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. After Joseph said this, his brothers felt much better. And now we'll turn to Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if my brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times. But I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, the Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave, as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This little rock, this little pebble, I carry with me everywhere I go. This little rock reminds me of Charlie Cox. Charlie, in preschool, stole my block. And he knew I was playing with it. And so I carry this rock with me everywhere I go. Because I trust that one day, I'll be able to toss this back at Charlie. Then I carry this one right here. 
And this one reminds me of the lady in the dark blue Mazda. She cut me off, almost made me spill my coffee. One day I'll see her again. This one right here. The cashier at the grocery store. He should have known that I was in a hurry. It took such a long time, but one day, I'll get him. Then I've got some that are a little bigger. This one right here is reserved for my so-called friend that told that lie about me. Here's one for my old boss. She made my life difficult for so many years that I carry this one around just for her. Then, there's some much bigger ones. This one's for that family member that hurt me by what they said and what they did. I carry this heavy rock for that family member. <laughs> this one here. When the church didn't stand up for me when I thought they should. This one's pretty heavy. Hope these don't fall off. I don't usually show this one to many people, and I don't like to talk about it. This one is for all the times that I have failed. This one represents me. Hmm. All these rocks. Obviously, I don't actually carry around rocks with me everywhere I go. Because the truth is that I can't afford the gas for the amount of dump trucks it would take to carry every single rock. But I imagine every one of us can bring to our minds at least one or two things from the past. Ways that we were wronged or mistreated that we are still carrying the weight of every single day. Unfortunately, every day of our lives, new stones are being heaved our way. Some tiny, others huge. And we're left to decide whether to carry the load with us or whether to leave it behind. It could be said that there is no more central theme to the Christian faith than forgiveness. And so as followers of Jesus, what are we, if not people who model a lives of pardon and grace? None of us would dispute the significance of forgiveness, but our life experience tells us that some stones are easier to set down and leave behind than others. Peter's question comes on the heels of Jesus' teaching about dealing with conflict in the church. And no doubt he's already thinking about scenarios where the same person is a repeat offender. And his question to Jesus is, when is enough enough? We know the phrase, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We know the sports analogy of giving someone three strikes and they're out. Peter starts with an even more generous suggestion that we should forgive a person seven times. In Hebrew, the word seven is spelled with the same letters that are used for the word that means full or complete or an abundance. 
So Peter is thinking, surely seven times is more than enough chances to give someone. Sometimes I struggle to find the strength to forgive a person one time, much less seven. In Luke's gospel, it's not Peter that suggests seven times of forgiving, but Jesus. There in Luke 17, Jesus says, If the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. The disciples' response to Jesus' teaching in Luke is completely relatable. They say, oh Lord, increase our faith. Seven times in one day? We need God's help. But back to Matthew, Jesus says, no, it's not just seven times, but 77 times. Or some translators say 70 times seven. We won't get caught up in the numbers because Jesus's point isn't that we should keep track and unload on a person on their 78th offense or their 491st infraction. Jesus is intentionally exaggerating to say there should be no limit to the number of times we forgive a person. We're supposed to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. Has Jesus ever been more out of touch with reality? He's acting like every offense is equal. As if we can forgive someone for accidentally stepping on our toe and then just as easily forgive them for intentionally kicking our dog. When it comes to the things we're asked to forgive, we're not exactly comparing apples to apples. Some words and behaviors are harder to shake than others, right? How can Jesus suggest that every violation should just be released, no matter how painful it may be? Well, he tells a story. He says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. One of the slaves is brought before the king who owes him 10,000 talents. For those not up to date on your talent to dollar currency conversion calculator, 10,000 talents would be equivalent to over $226 million today. There's no way that slave would be able to repay the debt. So he falls on his knees and he begs for more time. More time to come up with 10,000 talents. Most people in those days worked over 16 years to earn enough for one talent. But the servant begs, just give me 160,000 years and I'll pay it. The sheer hopelessness of the servant's request is what makes the king's response so jaw-dropping. The king has pity on the man. He was moved with compassion. So he released him and forgave his debt. And Jesus could have ended the story right there. And the slave went away and lived happily and wealthily ever after. But no, his story follows the slave. And it goes... And the slave goes out and comes across another slave who owes him 100 denarii. One denarii was the typical wage for one day of work. So we're talking about maybe somewhere around $10,000. The fellow slave pleased with him using the words that should have been very familiar to him. Have patience with me and I'll repay you. But the slave was hearing nothing of it, so he had him thrown in jail until he could pay back all that he owed. The one who was shown unfathomable mercy 
was the one who displayed relentless cruelty. The one who experienced the release of forgiveness was the one who shackled his neighbor in a cell of callousness. The one who had his debt erased, put his debtor on display to be shamed and ridiculed. Jesus told the story to illustrate that he not only understands the magnitude of forgiving those who have wronged us, but the absurdity of our resistance to forgive others in light of all that we have been forgiven. When we hold on to the stones that have been thrown our way, We enjoy a certain amount of complaining about how unjustly we have been treated. But the pile of rocks that we cling to clouds our vision from seeing the mountains of stones that we have heaved at others. Somehow God looks at us and all the damage that we have caused and is moved with compassion. Somehow we look around at all those who have harmed us and all we can muster is anger and resentment and hopes for revenge. Some of us have been carrying these heavy stones for a long time. And it can be exhausting. Some of these stones have become so much a part of who we are that we're not sure what life would look like without them. Jesus knows that it's hard to turn them loose. Especially the the things that we carry that were particularly painful. How can we just let go? Without feeling like our side of the story has even really been heard. Christ hears you. As you lay it down, trust that there is nothing you can say that he has not already heard crying from your heart. As he was hanging on the cross. Christ Jesus was being crushed under the weight of the sin of the world. And he had every right to cry out in rage for the way that he was treated But he found the strength to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. After his death, they carried his body to a tomb, and in front of the opening, they rolled a huge, immovable, solid stone. On the third day, The women came to prepare his body, and when they arrived, the boulder that once stood between them and their Lord was miraculously rolled away. If our God can remove the stone that was designed to hold the darkness of death, imagine what God can do with these rocks of resentment that we've been carrying. How many stones should we allow him to move? One? Maybe seven? Or is it 77? I have a feeling we might lose count. 